a lot of minds. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce Danny Grace to deliver this lecture. Danny has written and spoken extensively on the history of Tipperary. His major works are Portrait of a Parish, Monsi and Kiladirna, The Great Famine in Nina, and of course more recently I was at his launch of A History of the Kiladang and GAA. He has also wrote and contributed many articles to the Nina Garden. I was just reading one this morning at breakfast uh, about um, a gentleman, or whether you call him a gentleman or not, that escaped from Nina Jail some time back. So, um, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Danny Grace. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Mike. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me down the back? That child is probably the most important thing of all. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, uh, Johnny's here. Uh, Johnny's my, my uh, I suppose, what you would call it, my technological assistant here, so uh, without him, I, I couldn't be functioning at all. So, uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, tonight is undoubtedly an historical occasion to have so many members of the DC clan from such diverse backgrounds and places gathered together in one room. We are meeting here in the ancient town of Nina, in Aberfoon, the centre and the capital of the old territory of Ormond. It is the most appropriate place, it's the most appropriate place, uh, meeting place, because the barony of Upper Ormond, to the south of us, was the ancestral home of the Gleasons. Ladies and gentlemen, just to dampen things slightly, I have to begin with a confession. As far as I'm aware, I have not one drop of decent blood in my veins from either side of my family. I don't believe even Morris Gleason's uh, DNA kit would prove otherwise. My parents' names, Grace and Hackett, were of sound Norman origin. So in the Middle Ages, my ancestors were probably regarded by new native Gleasons as right upstarts who had come to Tipperary with the ill intention of plunder and land grabbing in their hearts. How right they were. <laughs> but I can't say in mitigation that my wife Mary has impeccable Gleason credentials. Her grandmother was Mary jo George Gleason of Ballyhisky Valley William, and her great great grand, also Mary Gleason, won a modicum of local fame during the land war of 1880 which she got six months in jail for sending a threatening letter to a neighboring farmer who had broken ranks and paid his rent. That same Mary Gleason, incidentally, later went on to become a nun. <laughs> but, but all that, John, there is, by the way, as the focus of my talk tonight is another member of the Gleason clan. Dermot Clarence Gleason is a man who deserves wider recognition and, I think, far greater appreciation in this part of County Tipperary because he was, to put it in a nutshell, the father of his local history. Now, I never met Dermot Gleason, nor do I believe I ever heard his name mentioned when I was growing up at night a few miles north of this town. But I have always credited him as the person who first stimulated my interest in local history, an interest that for better or for worse will got to become a lifelong preoccupation. While I was a student of history at UCD in the early 1970s, my brain was chock full of topics such as the Eastern Question, the origins of the First World War, and the rise of fascism in Europe. But, you know, if you had asked me who had built my castle, which I passed by daily for years, or what was the history of the church ruins that lay under its shadow, I honestly couldn't have given you an answer. One day, while idling in the library at Belfry, uh, students were sometimes known to idle in those days, I happened by accident 
upon a slim red volume named The Less Lords of Ormond by a Dermot F. Gleason. And book and author, I may say, previously unknown to me. Now, I was amazed to discover references to such familiar places as Templeberry, Terry Glass, and Theo, and even more familiar places such as Drummondier, Kearney, and my own now. And, you know, I still vividly recall, after all those years, sitting down for the afternoon and avidly reading through that book. Dermot Leeson, who was himself a keen fisherman, had cast his bait and had wooed me for life on the line of local history. Now, what were the origins of this Dermot Leeson, who, had such, who has had such a profound effect on the study of local history of this area? This particular branch of the Leesons came originally from the old parish of Killinay, the Church of the Saints, in Upper Ormond, some ten miles or so to the south of this town. Dermot Leeson's grandfather, John Leeson, born in 1810, died in 1887, was the first of the family to settle in the town of Nina, at the old turnpike, now known as Ormond Street. You know, John was an interesting character and well deserves a talk in his own right. Uh, you could probably best describe him as a clever, upwardly mobile young man who had his finger in several pies. And like any clever young man, and maybe not so young at the time, and true man, he married well and into property. He worked in the Ordnance Survey during the 1830s, which explains why he gave his occupation as surveyor in some documents. Connected with these occupations, with that occupation, were his allied activities as a land agent and what we would probably call an auctioneer today. Now, John, if you just move on to the next two there, this is just one there, as you can see, hay for sale, 80 tons for sale at Tullamore Park outside the town, and where do you go to actually buy the hay? Mr. John Gleason, Old Turnpike, 1855. The second one is, now I don't expect you to read through all of those at all, but Clarence Celeste at Lower Berlin, and again, who's the agent for the levy, proposals to be addressed to Mr. John Gleason, Old Turnpike, Nina. February 9th. I think that one was, yeah, that one was 1860. He was, also, he was also a tenant farmer. Uh, I suppose that wasn't unusual because, after all, that was in background. And was the landlord of substantial house property in Nina, much of which had come to him through his marriage to Mary Ann Flannery. But those were, as it were, his sideline jobs. His main employment, the day job, was as clerk to the Nina town commissioners, the forerunner of the now steadily abolished Nina Urban District Council. He began working for the commissioners as their cess collector and inspector of nuisances at a salary of £20 per annum in 1842. Ten years later, in 1852, he was appointed clerk to the commissioners on a narrow vote, it was done by election of the councillors, of six to five. And he held the position right up to his death in 1887. We have to remember that he was then 77 years old. No talk of retirement in those days. You worked till you dropped. Now, hardly a week passed by when John Gleason's name did not appear in the local newspapers under some official notice from the town commissioners. I just show you two examples there. The first is from 1860 there, you can see John Gleason, you just look at the end of it there, clerk to the town commissioners. The second one is from the second one is from 1884, and you see in 1884 he had now assumed the grander and more grandiose title of town clerk. In 1850, in 1850, John Gleason he was then age 40, married 29-year-old Mary Ann Flannery, the third daughter of the late William Flannery, the man who had built and owned most of the houses 
in the leading street called after him, very, very close by William Street. The William family had a younger brother, William, who had an interesting career in the Catholic Church. He was ordained for the Canadian mission, but returned to the Diocese of Killaloo in 1860 due to ill health and was appointed curate of Tommy Vera. The following year, the bishop dispatched him to the USA to collect funds to build a new cathedral in Nina. But the American Civil War broke out soon after his arrival and only 600 pounds was collected. This sum was hit home to Nina and went towards putting the top back on Nina Castle. You might have noticed there that the very first slide there uh, that we started off with, that Nina Castle in the background having no top. So this money collected in America went to putting the top back on Nina Castle. Now, the reason was, of course, the restored castle was meant to act as the belfry for the new cathedral. Father Flannery did not come back to Ireland, but returned to Canada from the USA and had a distinguished career in the church there. He retired home to Ireland in 1901 and died and is buried at Boris the Cave. Space here a bit, so I'll have to leave it back. Uh, incidentally, it was this father, William Flannery, who wrote the well known song, My Quarter of Fries. It is apparently sung to the ear, although I won't attempt it since I have a note in my head, to the ear of Follow Me Up to Carolo. The poem of the song uh, celebrates a fine blue poem that had been sent to him by a friend in Tipperary to keep out the Canadian winter cold. The wool he fondly believed in the song was shorn from snow white lambs in Glen Canoe and the coat made by friendly hands in Nina. And to quote the, 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 the song, and now in distant Canada, as he put it, through my shanty, up and down, in prime I merge beneath thee. Now, John and Marianne Eason had ten children, five boys and five girls. The first born in 1850 and the last in 1866. Now, this is my excuse anyway. Since time is present, I can only briefly uh, state over a few of them, and I hope I won't be accused of sexism if I concentrate on the boys. I, I'm also uh, taking the motor chronological order. Now, just the, the ones to remember to look at there are the ones in blue Michael Gleason, John Gleason, William Gleason, and Joseph Gleason. Now, I'm not ignoring the other ones, but time pursues me, and anyway, of course, it's probably good to see what saying. I don't know a terrible lot about them either. Um, two of John Gleason's, uh, John and Mary and Gleason's sons, went into the church, and the daughter became a nun and the reverend mother of a convent. William or Willie joined the Jesuits and became, a well, became well known as a teacher at Mongrest and at Tangoes and also as a conductor of missions throughout Ireland. When he died at Gardner Street in Dublin in 1951, at the age of 89, he was the oldest member of the Jesuit order in Ireland. John, you can go on there, I think, the next one. John became a priest of the Diocese of Killaloo and died as parish priest of Laura in 1927. But his fame rests mainly on the fact that he was the author of the well-known local history, the history of Eli O'Carroll territory or ancient Norman, published in 1915. Now, this particular ad here is just hard to say that in the Mrs. Ryan's bookshop in Barrett Street in Nina. And you know, it's interesting to look at the price. It was in Carbac, but in 1915 it cost 10 shillings, which is a, a large amount of money, certainly at the particular time. Now, Dermot Leeson was always proud of his uncle's writings, and they were certainly a major inspiration to his taking up the study of local history. As indeed was his own father, Michael, a man also deeply versed in the history and folklore of Nina and District. But it was a source of regret to Dermot that his father, Michael, could never be induced to write it down. Perhaps. Perhaps a warning here for all local historians. You know, it's no use having it all in your head. You must 
have it recorded. But while Dermot greatly admired his uncle, he never hesitated to point out Father John's outdated interpretations and errors of fact in his own historical writings. Father John Peasons, History of Edo of Carroll, is often criticized. No, go back to me there, yet, John. Father John Peasons, History of Edo of Carroll, is often criticized by modern scholars. But as George Cunningham quite rightly pointed out in his introduction to its republication in 1982, and I'm quoting, certain academics decry the lack of professionalism and the absence of references. But the fact remains, we would be much the poor without his work. And I certainly would say, here, here, to that. Now, another son there, Joseph or Joss was born in 1864 and died as late as 1948. He was involved in local politics in his younger years and served as chairman of Dina Urban District Council. Joshua Joseph was a farmer and was widely known as a breeder of fine horseflesh. He bred several animals that we can to distinguish themselves on the race tracks of Britain and Ireland. Indeed, the most notable of these was Tipperary Boy, who enjoys the unique distinction of being the only horse to win the Galway Plate three times. Just recently, lived at the Turnpike, uh, now Arm Street, at Ivy House, but sold it in 1923 and moved to Benedict on the outskirts of the town. That's the ad there for the sale at the period of Nina Gerdin. Uh, the name of the house at Benedict, incidentally, now occupied uh, by his grandson Joe, who is here in the audience, was Benedict. Now, I have to ask you about this one at the end because this was also the name of one of the horses, one of uh, the old Mason's horses. So I'm not sure which them first, horse or house. Uh, but to return now to the eldest son, Michael Cleason, Dermot Cleason's father. Michael Cleason qualified as a solicitor in 1877 and returned to Nina where he built up a large practice particularly among the tenant farmers of North Tipperary. He very ably represented their interests in the land courts set up under the 1881 land debt. And as an obituary on his death in 1932 put it, in the old land days, his services, generously given, were sought by every tenant farmer in the county. Michael Thiessen also acted as the legal advisor to several public bodies, the Nina Board of Guardians, the Nina Rural District Council, and the Nina Town Commissioners. In 1885, he was elected as coroner for the Nina District of North Tipperary. Now, that's a fairly long document there, but really it is a PP, the, the office of coroner, by the way, was an elective office. And this is his appeal to the electors of North Tipperary. Uh, and indeed, it makes interest in reading. And you know, just to give you the highlights of it there, which I find interesting myself. Firstly, he says, the job should go to a Tipperary man. And of course, he puts up his hand and says, I am he. Secondly, he says, it should go to a national eagle. That's of course a supporter of the Home Rule Party. Again, let me put up my hand, says he, I am that man. And thirdly, and the clinching argument, which I actually like, says, Sure, I am one of yourselves, he says, involved in every popular movement down the years and related to most of you by ties of blood and friendship. You know, I don't think the wily Michael would be out of place canvassing today. <laughs> in 1895, Michael Cleason was appointed to the far more prestigious office that of Crown Solicitor for North Tipperary. He made history, by the way, by being the first Catholic ever to hold the post. The main function of the Crown Solicitor was to prosecute cases on behalf of the state. Notwithstanding his undoubted legal ability and his widespread popularity, which, by the way, is from largely from his involvement with a plethora of local sporting and cultural organisations, Michael Gleason probably owed his appointment to two factors. Firstly, his strong allegiance to an involvement in the National League or the Home Rule Party, which lobbied to get him the position. Secondly, 
the conservative government policy of the day of killing war rule with kindness. Uh, part of this policy entailed appointing Catholic nationalists to offices from which they had previously been excluded. There was great delight. There was great delight uh, that an Irish Catholic had gained such high office, and Michael Gleason's triumph was celebrated in Nina by an impressive banquet. But you know, I think it's important to see Michael Gleason's appointment in the wider context of late 19th century Ireland also. There was now a strong feeling among middle class Irish Catholics that they were no longer a subservient people, that their all had come as it were, and it was time to claim their rightful political, cultural, social, and economic birthright. This was seen in a number of facets of life at the time. The transfer of land ownership from a Protestant ascendancy to middle class to Catholic middle class farmers. The new pride that people were taking a political middle class in their native language and sports as evidenced by the Gaelic League and the GAA, and thirdly, the firm belief that they were entitled to rule their own affairs with a parliament in Dublin. But two decades later, men like Michael Gleeson found themselves in an invidious and dangerous position. The War of Independence of 1919-21 was now raging, and as strong solicitor, Michael Gleeson was part of the British legal establishment and might thus be seen as a legitimate target by extreme Republicans. Uh, and unfortunately for him, he was involved in very few sensitive political prosecutions. And he resigned the office in late 1920 in protest at the attempts by the town forces to burn the town of Nina. But I think it was somewhat ironic that while Michael Gleason was still crown solicitor, his two solicitor sons, Louis and Gerbert were appearing in cases in the illegal Sinn Féin courts. You know, it strikes me as another good example of the complexity of Irish history. After independence, Michael Gleeson continued in private practice almost up to his death in 1932. He was always popularly known as Mickey Gleeson the Crown in recognition of his former position. Michael Gleeson had married Julia Mary Boland in 1885. The 19-year-old census of population gave her place of birth as Dublin. The couple lived first at Peter Street in Nina, but later moved to the more salubrious surroundings of Georgia Summerhill. Now, go back to the other one, John, for a second. Uh, that was Summerhill, by the way, taken around the turn of the, the 20th century, when Dermot Gleeson would have been in short pants. That's the easiest way of putting it. And uh, it shows, by the way, of course, uh, the, the, the wrong side of the street, as it were, then, because uh, the Gleasons live on the sunnier side of the street, as I call it, but the next one there, John, uh, number 21, Summer Hill, uh, a fine, fine Georgian building there. Okay? Now, the Gleasons, by the way, um, Michael Gleason and Julia Mary Boland, who married in 1885, they had. Um, six children. Now, these are the names, as I got them from, uh, if, if there's any, anything wrong with those names, we played Dolo O'Hara in the genealogical service because they were supplied by them. But I have a feeling that actually some of the, these leases were known, uh, you know, by more, shall we say, more pet names. Uh, that Turlock, I, I think he could have been John. But anyway, we leave it. The, the one that I'm interested in there, of course, is the one, the, the upper boy, Dermot Dick. That's the one that I'm most interested in. Now, uh, looking about the names here, you notice the Christian names. They're very much a reflection of the Irish Ireland influence of the period. You know, they're all Gaelic names, Gaelic origin names, and very much reflected of the Irish Ireland influence of the period. Now, all of them had an interesting story. I've no doubt at all about that. But I will confine my remarks to the family member who is, after all, the focus of this talk. That's Gerbert Florence, please. Gerbert Florence, the oldest son of Michael and Julia Deason, was born at 21 Summerhill, Nina, on the 10th of December 1896. 
He received his primary education at the local Christian Brothers, just up the road, uh, and his secondary at the Jesuit boarding school at Bongrave in Liverpool. He took his BA degree at University College Dublin, where incidentally, the executed 1916 leader, Thomas McDonough, was one of his lecturers. After his graduation, he returned to Nina, and, you know, it's often a little known fact, he acted as editor of the Nina Garden for some months before he returned to Dublin to take up the study of law. He was, without a shadow of a doubt, a brave and legal student and was awarded the gold medal of the Solicitor's Apprentice Society for 1917-18. He made a brief foray into politics during the eventful general election of 1918, when he travelled to East Mayo to canvass for the Sinn Féin candidate Eamon de Valera. He wrote afterwards, I have vivid recollections of addressing a meeting of about 400 Mayo men in Barnes outside Dr. Farron's house in Foxford, uh, to the light of blazing sides of turf carried on, carried on pitchforks. He qualified, Dr. Peterson qualified as a solicitor in 1920 and practiced for a short time in Loch Ray, apparently to help out a legal friend who had been detained by the British authorities. He then returned to work in Nina, where his father, Michael, and his brother, Louis, were already in practice. Louis had qualified in 1916 and would work as a solicitor in the town up to his death in 1960. Dermot also opened an office in Boris Cain and built up a fine practice among the farmers of Lower Orme. In late 1920, he married Aileen O'Dwyer of Tipperary Town and the couple would go on to rear a family of five boys and two girls. Uh, incidentally, three of the sons followed father and grandfather into the legal profession. In October 1922, the new Free State Home Affairs Minister, Kevin O'Higgins, appointed Dermot Cleason the district, as District Justice for County Clare. He was just 26 years old, in fact I'm not too sure he barely had 26 barely even arrived at the time, and he was the youngest of all the 27 appointees, first appointees, and he also holds the distinction of being the youngest ever district justice in the history of this state. You know, looking back on it now, I think it was a brave decision on Dermot Cleason's part to accept the appointment, particularly as he was a newly married man and was building up a fine private practice in Vienna for us again. Ireland was then in the throes of civil war and accepting the post put him clearly in the free state camp, especially in County Clare, where there was a strong Republican antipathy towards the new state and its agents. He held his first court sessions at Venice Courthouse in late November 1922. He began proceedings in Irish, but then left into English to accommodate those not proficient in the language. For, he said, he believed that the day was soon coming when we shall be able to conduct the business of the court in the Irish language. You know, I suppose this was another of those pious aspirations of the independence movement that never really came to fruition. He then went on to stress two important points. Firstly, that the new court system would be the servant of the people and not its master, or like the old system. Secondly, that the judges would not rise or fall with political parties and would be independent of them. You know, again, maybe another example of the idealism of the revolutionary period that didn't always quite work out in reality. Dermot Cleason settled permanently in Clare and in 1925, purchased the Carnelli House and lands, which remained the decent family home of the recent times. This beautiful mid 18th century mansion resonated with history. The legendary Maura Rua O'Brien, uh, I could suppose best describe her as a nearly militant feminist who was particularly noted for having bedded three husbands. 
uh, should I say, to haunt the Avenue. It is also the home of head former home of Peter the Packer O'Brien, who ended up as Lord Chief Justice of Ireland. Now, his nickname, the Packer, had come from his practice of packing juries when earlier he had been Attorney General for Ireland. I don't think Dermot Cleason would have approved. Dermot Cleason served as District Justice for 40 years, 25 of them in County Clare and the remainder in Limerick City and District, which extended as far as Turles. When he died, the Irish Times referred, to, referred in an obituary to his brilliant legal mind and remarked that the legal profession acknowledged him as, and I'm quoting, the outstanding justice on the Irish bench. But he conceded that while he was always courageously fair, he nevertheless held strong views on certain legal and social matters. Views influenced by his strong Catholic beliefs and his comfortable middle class background. Now, reading through the press reports of some of these cases, one can detect at times a lack perhaps of understanding of the difficulties and provisions of the poor and the underprivileged. But you know, that is a fault that was common to most judges of that time, and I think to be true to say, it's a fault still found among some of them even nowadays. But our main concern tonight is with Dermot Cleason, the historian. Now, in the next chart there, I try to reduce, as it were, Dermot Cleason's writings. In the chart you're looking at, I divided his historical output under three headings. Firstly, books and pamphlets. Secondly, articles in learned journals. And thirdly, more popular historical articles in newspapers. Now, if you add up the five books, the 41 learned articles, and the 47 newspaper articles, they certainly come to a very impressive total. Virtually all of that prodigious output concerns aspects of the history of Northwest Tipperary during medieval and early modern times. Nobody had written so prolifically on the area previously, nor, had anyone man nor has anyone managed to do so since. And you know, this is one reason that I have no hesitation in giving him the title which I did here in the beginning, the father of local history of this area. But you know, there's another reason also for giving him that title. What he has written is not just any old history and is far removed from much of the local history of that period. History, more usually based on a mix and gathering of folklore, secondary sources, and often fanciful speculation. Dermot Leeson's work has stood the test of time because he was a true scholar who based his findings on a study of original documents and careful field work. He always judiciously weighed up his evidence before committing, it to, before committing his conclusions to paper in a clear and vigorous style. He was one of the few indeed one of the very few local historians of the period to win academic approval of his work. This was reflected in his being elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 1937 and the awarding to him of the National University of Ireland Prize in Irish Historical Research two years later. In 1941, the National University of Ireland conferred the degree of Doctor of Literature on him in recognition of his published work, particularly the last Lords of Ormond. Now, there he is, by the way, in his Doctor's full canonicals. Uh, the eminent, by the way, you know, I think his achievements were even all the more remarkable when you think of it, that firstly, he was a busy district justice. Secondly, that he was the father of an large family. And thirdly, that in County Clare, he lived fair from the main libraries and, re uh, and repositories to do his research. You know, uh, and of course, there was no online things, no online sources, anything like that in his day. So like, I think even those facts have to be taken into consideration 
whom we consider his greatness as a local historian. The eminent medieval historian, Professor Edmund Cortes, summed up his standing very well in a tribute to him in 1941, and I'm quoting, he is one of the few and one of the best of the real local historians who we have in Ireland today. His first, his first and most enduring book was The Last Lords of Ormond, published by Sheed and Ward of London in 1938. He was brought out in Harvard at a price of seven and sixpence. Uh, for those not acquainted with the book, with the work, it traces the history of land ownership in the two Ormonds, both before and after the Cumberland confiscations of the mid 17th century. Professor Edmund Curtis of Trinity College hailed the book as a tour de force of local history. Reverend Professor John Ryan of UCD considered it a magnificent piece of work. Other reviewers praised his confident mastery of the sources, the clear and easy style in which it was written, but above all, the humanity that breathed through every page. The book sold out quickly and it was reprinted in 1942. In 1956, the stationery office in Dublin brought out an Irish translation by Richard of Aulu, Tierney Gerard Ervo. The book remained out of print for many years, although uh, much sought after. Then, in 2001, Donald and Nancy Murphy of Relay Books in Nina brought out a revised and updated edition for a new generation of readers. I was privileged to contribute a short biographical sketch to Dermot uh, to that book. His second most important work was the more encompassing A History of the Diocese of Killaloo, written in collaboration with Reverend Professor Audrey Gwynn, S.J. A reviewer in the Irish Examiner newspaper described it as a model for future, history, for future writers of diocesan history. The writer Stephen Ring devoted a quarter of the program on, our, on Radio Air discussing its merits. But Derek Leeson did not confine himself totally to the king. He was the book sought after lecturer on various aspects of local history, including in his native town of Nina. His lectures here got extensive coverage in the Nina Garden, and I'm just showing you two examples of reports. Now, like any good local historian, Dermot Leeson kept his eyes and his ears open when he was out and about on his recreational pursuits. One January day in 1934, he was out shooting rabbits near Valley Vaughan in County Clare with his district court clerk, when they called to the house of the Canole family. Young Patrick Canole showed their location an old object that he had found among rocks two years previously. The Canoles thought it was a mounting from an ancient cotton, and believing that it would bring bad luck, uh, had hidden it away outside. Their location immediately recognized this, its significance and contacted Dr. Alfred Mayer, the director of the National Museum. It was identified as a rare and precious object, an exquisitely crafted gold collar or garter dating to the Bronze Age. It is now on display in the National Museum as the Glenin Sheen Collar, named after the clear town man where it was found. That's just a um, close of detail. And it certainly is a beautiful and one of the, you know, the magnificent artifacts of Bronze Age Ireland. Now, there's one final aspect of Dermot Leeson I just wish to talk about briefly. He also dabbled in writing verse under the pseudonym Maclea. I say dabbled because he himself would make no claim to any great poetic talent, and unlike his study of local history. Writing verse was more of a passing interest and fancy with him 
than a serious commitment. Yet I have to say, I find many of his verses particularly interesting because they belong to a type of poetry that regrettably has almost disappeared in this global and supposedly sophisticated age. They are simple and musical in expression. They are racy of the soil in theme. They are, above all, a stirring celebration of his native place and its people. In 1958, he published a small pamphlet of 21 poems under the title Songs of Order. Now, I would like just to recite a few lines, or the first lines of some of the better known ones, just to give you a flavour. So you would bear with me while I, as it were, root them out. I thought you could take it from there. Now, the Morgany men celebrating Upper Arma and the hill country to the south of Nina from where the Gleasons came. From Nina's green valley, the white roads are winding, and winding and rising again o'er the plain, to where the wide heather and splendor is binding, the blue hills of Orma in sentinel chain. And there where the kestrel in freedom is wheeling, and wheeling and poising o'er Karen and Fen, the smoke of the peat fire forever is stealing, they are over the holes of the mountain in air. Now, the second one, a ballad of Ormond Fair, it recalls a way of life now cast aside into the dustbin of history. Oh, the morning was dark and the rain coming soon, as I took to the road and I wished it my true, with my heifers before me and driving them down from the hillside of Calm to the fair in the town. Don't mind the next line, that's okay. Now, for those who are not afraid of the place, Cow is up there above Port Road. The, the Song of the Shannon, uh, as well as joyful celebration of days of boating and fishing, both of which are at least loved as well, and beautiful Loch Garret. Oh, give me a song of the wild rolling river. That sweet from the gallant that her to the sea, and sing me a strain of Derb's wide, wide rippling waters that bound the horizons of boyhood for me. For fair though I wander from Ormond's green valley, our arrows tall hillsides wherever I roam, in waking or sleeping, in sunshine or shadow, the song of the Shannon is calling me home. Now, this one is a particular favourite of mine, uh, Ode to a Bundar. Not that I ever did any shooting or anything, because I, I, I didn't, but uh, I think that the reason I'm biased is that the author uh, later on added a note that Father Horace Hill, as you see down there at the bottom, was actually Nye Hill, uh, of course, uh, under whose brow I was born. So uh, I'm fairly biased on this one. So, O Prince, that's the dog's name, O Prince, where are the partridges? Where shall we go today? There's a coy down in Darcy's, I've heard the trashy say. And in Paddy Moss's turnips, there's a set in every drill. And there's more than one cock pheasant up at Father Murray's Hill. And then it goes then to celebrate that. Now, Dermot Eason collapsed and died at a medieval banquet at Bunratty Castle on Saturday the 22nd of September, 1962. He had just finished reciting one of his own first compositions, probably the place where I was born. His death was reported in all the national newspapers. The two extracts there, which I'm showing you together, are from the Irish press and the Irish Independent. The Nina Gerton gave extensive coverage to the death of the towns of one of the town's most distinguished sons. He was laid to rest at Killinay Cemetery, the ancestral burial place of the Gleason family. The wish he had expressed in his best known poetic composition, the place where I was born, had indeed come true. In Ormond here, that's his gravestone there by the way on the left, in Ormond here how sweet would be to die when death shall come to me, and lay me down by Shannon's tide, or high on Ormond's green hillside, to rest me till the judgment morn in this old place 
where I was born. Now, as I said at the beginning, Dermot Gleeson's contribution to local and national scholarship has perhaps not been as fully appreciated in his native place as probably it should be. No plaque, no plaque to his memory stands at his birthplace in Summerhill. Nor is there anything to remind us of him about the town of Nina. But two people who have helped keep his memory alive are two fellow local historians, Donald and Nancy Murphy of Nina. Not only did they bring the last Lords of Ormond back into print for a new generation of readers in 2001, they had also financed the erection of a seat to his memory along the Nina River Walk. The historic River of Gale, which features so prominently in Dermot Reason's historical writings. The inscription on the seat reads, For Dermot F. Reason, 1896-1962, 21 Summer Hill and Clare Castle, historian of all Ormond and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's a fitting tribute that says it all. Thank you very much. Well, Danny, no words of mine could thank you for that excellent, detailed, and well researched lecture. Um, it's a fitting tribute to the beginning of our Gleason Clan Gathering weekend. And you expressed there at the very end the very same sentiments that had often occurred to me. That there is no plaque or, commem or anything to commemorate Dermot Gleason. And I would hope that as part of this group, that we would do something to redress that. After all, in another town in this country, there is a Gleason Street, and it does commemorate another Gleason man born in, in this region and that I'd be referring to uh, tomorrow. And I would hope that the local district council here would look at naming some street, some area here, after one of North Tipperary's greatest people, Dermot F. Gleason. So we will leave no stone unturned to, to see what can we do to bring that about. Um, I just laughed there, he, he, his first there, the wild he heather is splendid. He must have written that in the month of August, because I can assure you the wild heather is splendid at the moment. I spent two days in the Cooney Mountains, where I had bees at the moment foraging and wild heather. I spent yesterday in the Bog of Allen, where I had more bees, and the heather is at its best at the moment. So I can really uh, associate with Dermot Nathan and his writing because it's a beautiful time of the year. Uh, most flowers have passed their best at this time, but header, header areas are just peaking at the moment. Um, that's just a side issue. <laughs> it's my second note, peaking. Um, we're very honoured here tonight to have immediate uh, family members of Dermot Leeson, his two sons. We're delighted to welcome here, Noel and Donna. Their wives, their families, uh, their grandchildren. It's, it's a great honour and a privilege. We thank you for your support, for turning out in such great numbers. Um, I would like to call on Donna to vote, to propose a vote of thanks to Danny. And after that, if anyone would like to ask questions of Danny, be free to do so, or of Donna. So I now hand you over. Well, good evening, everyone. I am Dan, but I have to confess that I was called not after a Gleason, but after my mother's family, the Edward Wilds Corporation. 
Uh, two of them were actually on the island, they fought General Ireton. But the Dutch guns were better than the cavalry. Philip escaped, but someone betrayed my ancestor Dara and he was hung. So I was called after him. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Thank you. Yes, right in. Right in. Is that better? Yes. Right. Even right in. Try to get your chair. Try to get your chair. Right. Got it. Um, before thanking um, uh, Danny Grace for his wonderful talk, just two little additives about my father, which he might not have known or, or heard. He was a great fisherman. And he had all my grandfather's rods, and we used to go fishing, and he very regularly came home with two or three salmon from the, um, the Merlin River, where we used to, 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 to fish. He was a great fisherman. But he was also a man who liked shooting, and we kept our own dogs as cockers, and uh, he used to go shooting quite a lot, and he bred up his own uh, pheasants. In, we had 70 acres of parkland at Parnelli. He bred up his own pheasants and he used to shoot them. And he went to Oxford to shoot as well. And talking about his poem and the dogs, he was very fond of dogs. And the dog that he loved most was called Captain. I remember so well. Now, two other little vignettes about the family. You heard about my uncle John, the historian. Um, John was the sort of man who believed in, in, in the Bible, and if someone, he met someone on a cold day who didn't have a coat, he immediately took off his coat and gave it to him, poor John. But uh, this, of course, became very well known, and the teachers used to gather around and wait for Father John to come, and they none of them had coats, and of course the coat was taken, was ended up in the local pub very quickly for cash. <laughs> He, he did write a great history, I've read it, but unlike my father, he didn't give his sources. My father was a lawyer, of course, and he gave sources, and it was from those sources that the value of his book really is, because you can trace them all there at the bottom, and that, that makes it very credible and very important and very authoritative. Um, one last uh, little story about uh, my uncle Willie Gleason. The SJ. He taught, yes, at a number of schools, but he also taught at Belvedere, the Jesuit school in Dublin. And one of his pupils was a certain James Joyce. And he was asked to uh, give a testimonial to James Joyce when Joyce was leading. Now, before this, James Joyce had a habit of, before my uh, uncle would come in to teach, on the blackboard would be uh, emblazoned with, shall we say, a young lady perhaps caught in mid-action. And this, of course, didn't appeal in any way to <laughs> my uncle, who was a very straight his man. And what he wrote at the end of the day about James Joyce was, just in terse terms, this is a wicked and most perverse young man. And James Joyce got to know of it and was thrilled. <laughs> yes, I am the most perverse young man. Now <laughs> uh, to thank yet again, uh, Danny Grace for uh, a talk on my father, which seemed to bring out not only the facts of the history, but to make them come alive and to bring about the, uh, the nature of the man. This was the kind of man that he was, and it, the story that he told brought this out for you. So, uh, to Danny Grace, thank you very much indeed. And finally, to everyone else who's involved in this, particularly uh, Michael and Morris Gleason, and uh, no doubt their mothers, wives, aunts, daughters, all the rest, who help on all these occasions. Um, thank you very much. Everybody here is deeply grateful to you. Uh, uh, thanks again to Danny Pace for a wonderful talk. I haven't heard anything like it before. In fact, I've never had a talk in my life. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very grateful.
Any questions for for Danny or don't be shy now. Don't all rush together. We have a question over here. Yeah. I'll come round with the roving microphone. There we go. <laughs> I I was just wondering when I saw his pen name for the poems, the one for poems, Mark Neal. Was that an attempt at gaysization gay of Dixon by any chance? Mark, you know, it's a gay 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 where he came from. Uh, MacLear was the uh, Britain historian of the Dalcassian clan, uh, to whom uh, Dermot gave a certain amount of adulation. The, the uh, 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 origins of the O'Briens in uh, and the, the um, Brian Pools people. Uh, just to, may, may I just add there for those of you uh, who may not know them, that's uh, who spoke there, that's Donald Murphy and his wife Nancy, who was responsible for the republication of uh, the last laws of government in 2001, and also for directing the lovely seas, actually, and I think that was a really nice thing to do. Uh, there's a, a series of seats now, there's a river walk now, literally, I suppose, the handiest way of putting it is going from this funny down almost to Drummondeer, along the Needle River, the Bank of Needle River, and it's a beautiful wall. But in the park between uh, Scottsbridge and this body, there's a number of seats. And uh, one of the seats, uh, various people got seats dedicated to different people. So Donald and Nancy was responsible for putting up the seat to Dermot Peace. And I think it was a very, very nice question. With that lavish introduction, <laughs> I'm bold enough to add a couple of uh, snippets of information to Danny's. Uh, brilliant, my wife says, and I would say perfect. Uh, talk, lecture, dissertation, a superb example of uh, a history and English teacher in his, the full flower of his Maybe it's a youth uh, of his um, accomplishments. Um, Peter Street, uh, Peter Street, now called Kickham Street, under the uh, 1964 uh, remaining, uh, remaining of the street. Uh, you might like to know that uh, Dermot's original house, that's news to me. Uh, Thomas, I should say, uh, but his office uh, was where Brendan Moran's surgery, dental surgery, was until recent times. I'm not sure who has now occupied it. How we know that is that um, when Louis Gleason, Dermot's brother, uh, died, and his effects were auctioned in Somerville, uh, my mother uh, went there at my request to see, uh, I was elsewhere, uh, could she pick up anything of uh, strong uh, connections with uh, Dermot and Michael Creason, who we knew of from the history of the Ladder Terror. And for two and sixpence, a half hour, uh, she bought uh, three items, uh, two the contents of which were worthless, although the, the half pound wouldn't have covered a fraction of the cost of one of the frames. But one was a beautiful uh, pen and ink drawing signed by Michael himself of Nina Castle. But it wasn't the, the viewpoint uh, that we all know from uh, down from the church dramas uh, or from the prison's entrance or the revived Nina Castle. And we uh, uh, towards the area of perspectives, and uh, we wound up in the top floor of Brendan Murnan's 
uh, surgery. So obviously, the, the test that the initial portrait was taken from there, the, 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 the artist with Michael Gleason, hence the conclusion that that was the solicitor's uh, residence. Um, another thought, thought occurred to me was uh, that uh, none of us uh, can come to print uh, and particularly on anything detailed uh, without help. And Michael Delaney, I'm not certain his address, certainly Upper Ormond, was given credit by Dermot Gleeson uh, uh, very uh, generously uh, expressed for his work, his research in London in the archives, uh, which helped uh, Dermot considerably and is an answer uh, or amplifies uh, Danny Grace's information uh, uh, to, to how the Dermot uh, do uh, in the waters of clear uh, he had help uh, from London. Uh, Dennis, Dr. Dennis Marnan of Tipperary Town and Con Manning, Con Manning who is lectured to the Ormond uh, Historical Society were considerable help uh, to myself in amplifying uh, the information in Dermot's last words of Ormond. And uh, we were encouraged to do so and to recast the chapters because uh, she'd been more the editor in London without any uh, much Irish knowledge, not mine, not the very knowledge, uh, didn't quite know enough to put to edit. A, a, a local history. So um, we talked to Dermot Jr., uh, since deceased, a brother of the gentleman who spoke now, uh, uh, son of Dermot, of course, and he encouraged us to uh, recast as we needed to <coughs> and to amplify. And he said that uh, something that's uh, in order for one generation, as was my conclusions of history of the Eli O'Carroll, need, needs to be amplified and corrected. Go ahead, as my father, Dermot Gleason, did for his uncle, uh, uh, Michael. I would like to echo also both the German's uh, uh, hope and Danny's uh, for a fact to be written in 21 summer hill, and that it would include whoever undertakes that test and so many towns have done it beautifully for their eminent citizens uh, to include uh, both Michael the Crown and Dermot the historian of all Ireland and beyond. Thank you. Quick question, Donald. What would it take to get the last words of Ormond reprinted in 2016? Because it's 15 years now since the last reprint of the book. A very quick shot for the 5,000 uh, euros. That's a very quick one now because without, without recording. It's all in the talking to uh, properly. I'm subject to correction and all that. Uh, uh, guess five or six thousand euros. The guest must know. Yeah, that, that's good to know because uh, I think it's, a, it's an absolutely fantastic book. And uh, you can't get it now for love of money. And I think it goes for hundreds of dollars on eBay and uh, these various places. So to have it in our hands again, I think, would be a, a, a gift. So hopefully that can happen at some stage. Sorry, I have, sorry. Uh, I have actually um, a very, very, uh, it's not so much, it's a valuable copy of the last as well, but a very valuable copy. And uh, the uh, thesis might be interested in this particular one. Uh, the late canon Edward Fyde, who was parish priest of South Jordan, and man very, very interested in history, and who uh, I was very fond of, I was a great friend of his, and his, of me. Uh, when you retire as parish priest of South Jordan, by the way, he had been cured in Clare Castle, and uh, 
he uh, can and White, Edward White. Uh, he knew your father quite well, actually, and I think they may have uh, tried to swing uh, golf suits together uh, a number of times as well. Uh, Canon White's sort of thing anyway was that he's uh, uh, saying with a uh, tongue in cheek that Dermot Gleason's uh, driving on the golf course was erratic as he's driving on the road. <laughs> now, uh, I thought, I mean, at that I threw up my eyes in laughter for the simple reason that Canon White's driving, God help us, was worse than. <laughs> Than anything else. Uh, he, he was later parish, he died a few years ago there, he was parish priest in South Jordan. But, you know, no, but the, the point I just wanted to make was that when he retired, you know, people were all sorts of presents. And the only presents actually he wanted was a copy of Dermot Gleason's Last Lords of Ormond, because he had had a copy years ago, and foolishly, as we also tend to do, loaned it to somebody and never got it back. So, uh, I happen to actually know somebody who had a, a very good copy, and I won't say why I paid for it, it was actually a lot of money, and it got it bound in Kenny's at Galway, um, you know, beautifully bound, and there's a beautiful description from the parishioners of Top Jordan to Ken Nedo White on his, I can't remember, it might be retirement of more than you know, whichever one it was, and uh, he was very, very fond of it, and luckily he left it to me when he died. So, <laughs> I, 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 I encourage it. So, no, but it's just, you know, it's a prized sentimental book for two reasons, like, you know, because of it being Dermot Gleason's last dog born, original, usually bound copy, and because it belonged to Kevin White as well. So, it is, it is a sort of a book, you know, uh, a great book, really, you know. Do we have uh, other questions? Sure. Yeah, Paddy, Paddy Bolt, now I'll ask me a question here. Quick genealogical question. We have another Dermot Gleeson who's been prominent in public life as Attorney General and Chairman of AIB, who, as far as I know, was the son of another Judge Gleeson, a different Judge Gleeson. I think. Is he any relation or completely different family? Uh, one, one, one thing I have to say uh, straight off genealogy is not my strong point. You know, no, but people often say to me, it's not actually at all. I mean, I'd be more into history and social history. And genealogy is a passing interest rather than. Now, I shouldn't be saying that, of course, here among these continuing that you can gather in, but it's the truth. The Dermot Gleason, the Attorney General, was he uh, of Nina origins as well? So I think Donald, you see, ask, if you want anything to ask about Nina and old Nina, Donald Murphy down there is your man. Uh, Dermot, uh, Dermot Gleason, the Attorney General, famous for carrying the bag we always thought was the bones for the brief inquiry. Uh, he was a son of Judge John Gleeson, uh, who was born in uh, McDonough Street, where a uh, grandniece of his, Terry Gleeson, now lives. Uh, Judge John Gleeson uh, was um, a local government auditor. Uh, his brother was. <coughs> uh, his uncle, I should say, uh, was a John Gleeson who was the chairman of the first Nina, Tom, and uh, Trade and Labour Association, which swept the 1898 uh, elections for the first Nina Urban District Council. Uh, there, uh, the family is a long, here, long uh, tailed. Uh, family and it goes back to Patrick Gleason, uh, a, a founder, one of the founders of the first Nina Hurling Club, which is featured in the recent, recently produced history of uh, Nina uh, Hurling and uh, wider things. And the family has a Patrick uh, Pat, uh, Gleason, a member of the Limerick Minor. Hurling team and of, I think it's not a Piercy, uh, who, uh, I'm not sure, I, I'm, uh, it's like a mixture now between uh, the school and the county, but uh, all Ireland status and that. Uh, Good 
those, no, those, all that place in the printer, the increasing printer families, really, no, no connection whatsoever that we uh, know of. Uh, they, had, they had origins in uh, the, the Castle Rock, as distinct from the, the, the hill, the hill uh, regions uh, of Duty Road Talk. You see that family's name on many of the old memorial cards, decent printers name. I've seen many old memorial cards, and, and, and they were obviously the name printers for, for memorial cards and so forth. You mentioned there, uh, the, I'm fortunate to have a copy of the recent uh, Last Hours of Ormond, which I've read many times and still go back to it. An excellent book, very well referenced. And you can follow on further research. And um, it thought often occurred to me, Dermot published many other articles. Some appeared in the Nina Gout and some in various historic journals. Did anyone ever consider collecting, collecting them all and publishing in one volume? Wouldn't it be, uh, if, is there any truth in that, Danny, or what? Or are they copyright to the various journals that they appeared in, or what's his yeah, I, I don't know if they may be, but uh, it would be very interesting to have to me. There's, there's great material, in particular, from a, a genuine, sorry, from a, a real uh, deep historical point of view, some of the, the best work. I, I just gave it over it there, but those 31 articles that I mentioned in their journals, as distinct from the ones in newspapers, I mean, you know, he was again, sort of again, if I may say, uh, a man somewhat before his time as well, because even though he was actually a very fine scholar, he didn't mind, as it were, and now I, I use this word advisedly, lowering himself to popular history as well, which is the thing that people should be doing, you know, because very often, you know, uh, you have scholars who live in, in uh, rarefied uh, castles, as it were, and they don't come down to the common level. So, Dermot Lankwell, who was a very, very good scholar, a learned scholar, wrote in uh, 41 articles we, we have found in various learned journals like Analytical Hadernia and all these. But at the same time, he popularized local history as well and brought it down to the ground in his, in his article. And uh, they would be, most of them would certainly be worth uh, republication. It would be a very nice collection, actually, you know, of the, the essays we call it of Dermot Gleason. But just by finding word in, I'll shut up and sit down and, and go home. Uh, just, I, I, I stayed over some, some, some of the Michael Gleason, his father as well, an extremely interesting man. And, uh, you know, I could have said twice as much about him, uh, really, but because, for instance, I said nothing about his involvement in cultural and sporting organisations, like his involvement in the, in the, the founding rule, rules of the GAA, which he was involved in, uh, he was a, a noted cricketer and one of the founding members of the Nina Cricket Club as well. And this is just a, a number of things. And you know, we really actually appealed to the electors of North Prairie there to give him their vote as coroner of Tipperary. And when he, he was making a right in boast when he says, I'm involved in everything, I know you are, and I'm one of yourselves. You know? And you know, again to emphasize, you could see, you know, why there was such a popular claim and why there was uh, such a popular uh, joy when somebody like that was appointed to an office which was basically put in it was Protestant ascendancy that of counts to this year. Here was a man who had come from the people, a Catholic, one of their own, now being crowned solicitor. We have arrived. Do you know what I mean? It's a strong element of that in it. We have now arrived. And you know, when you think of it, Dermot was the first and youngest ever DJ. His father was the first ever town solicitor. So these reasons, they're not the first. You know, we need to think of it. Okay? Right. So that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Thanks. Wasn't it great when they did break the mold and move from the ascendancy that it was, that it was at least? <laughs> <laughs> not a great, but not about Kennedy or not a family, but a Keaton who got the first job as Crown Solicitor. So, um, any, would anyone else like to say anything or ask a question or raise anything? You're quite welcome. That's what we're here for, to exchange knowledge, views. What about Mary? Mary have you anything to say? 
You're the historian, I think, of that family. Would you like this? You have nothing. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, that's the man here. Jerry? Uh, I was walking the town earlier on, and I noticed opposite the Hibernia Bar, there is actually a place with the title um, Town Lecture Hall, written above the door. Now, would the Dermot have delivered any lectures there? In Nina? Yeah, so this is in Nina. Yeah. Opposite, opposite the Hibernia Bar. Yeah. And I'm going to different I don't know where we get the lectures. I am not for sure where we get the yeah, lectures in the town hall more than likely because he would be, uh, no, it would be expected that he would be uh, bringing a large crowd as he would to see, so the town hall is a normal place. I have a quick question while we have eminent historians in, in the audience. Where did the Gleasons come from? Because that <laughs> is a question that, and the answer might make me revise my slides tomorrow, so be very careful what you say, Daddy. No, I can have you any idea, because Dermot F. in his book says that they are of Muscari origin, yeah. possibly Muscari Muscari tier, but, um, and he says that there is some association possibly with other Muscari surnames like Malachny, Fihili, Burkari, and there was one of them which escapes me at the moment, but um, any, any ideas, Donna? Uh, yes, he went into this uh, quite a lot himself with some people from TCD. And they came to the conclusion at the end that it was a pre-Celtic, it was not a Celtic name. But it was pre-Celtic that they had intermarried and done well in the very early pre-Christian times. And they remained uh, in the country thereafter, and more or less the same. The, the name you're missing is Egan. Egan is another one of these names. If it's not Gaelic, it's not Celtic. It's pre-Celtic. It's not anything else. But he also discovered in Norway, a family of Gleesons up in the mountains, would you believe? Now, perhaps they were taken a sleigh to kept the name. I, I don't know during the Viking time, but there they are. Other point, there were Gleesons in Cork who had all Gleeson names. They were Dermot, John, Michael, um, Martin. They were no near relations of ours, and there were Gleesons in Galway. They had fled and stayed in Galway. And they, they established Gleason and Co, the big builders, who are now European builders, big, big place. There are two of them, those two little agenda. Very, very interesting. Um, in my own uh, research, I've come across three distinct groups of Gleasons. There's Gleasons from Imokelly in County Cork, um, who are uh, descended from the E Machkala clan, Imokelly, E Machkala, which in turn was the set of the E Leo. Um, set. I'm not sure my pronunciation is absolutely appalling, but uh, there was that, they seem to be distinct from the, the Muscovy Gleasons. And then there were Mac Gleasons, or Mac Glashines, in West Ulster, um, who are supposed to be Dal Fiatach, uh, um, an Ullad. So um, it's quite interesting to hear that they even met, went as far as Norway. Uh, so I think there's a lot more to the Gleasons than meets the eye. John. Uh, question for Donna. Um, are there not papers actually available in the archive anywhere? Sadly, no that I know of. He left the papers to St. Dan's College. There was a disastrous flood. He didn't look after them. The entire thing was destroyed. As we were speaking about these, and just only recently, I became aware that there's a town man in North Cork called, called Balia Bisson. Uh, I didn't get a chance to research it more. Balia Bisson, so Bisson's town or Bisson. So I think it's North Cork now, not far as you go south of the post Cork on the main road, that general area now. It's not in the Imokili area as far as I know. But you wonder, like, the town of Gleeson, or who Gleeson was, or... So, it's another area that warrants further investigation. Oh, indeed. The um, East Cork Gleesons from Imokili have been there since at least the 1400s. Uh, because we do see the, uh, the land of Odlassen, or Odlassen, uh, on the maps from that period. Mm -hmm. 
But as far as we know, they never won castings, or they were never one of the larger plans. There's no reference to the big castings like the O'Kennedys or the O'Briens or no hill forts or red forts. That Maybe, we know. Yeah. Even though I often wonder, um, looking at the old, I have a strong belief that um, the, the strongest concentration I could see was, was in the Kinmore Parish, the nowadays Silvermines Parish, and particularly in, in the, the western side of that, where it borders with the parish of Borges, basically between Kaparu Cross and, and Shari Cross. Over the, over the years, there seemed to be a very strong concentration of police and there. And I was looking at the, the early Arnold Sorbonne maps that were drawn up in the 1820s, and there seemed to be a lot of um, forts on that map, at that, uh, that map, they're probably all gone now with land reclamation. There was also a castle there known as Black Castle, the ruins of it in 1828 when the map was drawn up. There was also a, a mill nearby. And so I often wondered, um, was that the area where the Gleasons may have been at their strongest? Could they, those forts have been their early habitation? It's something I suppose we'll never know. <laughs> Well, it certainly is a, is a topic that deserves uh, further research, and if there are any PhD students in the audience who want to do, uh, take on that particular mantle of research, then uh, I'd certainly love to, to hear what they have to say in a couple of years' time. Uh, but certainly a lot of further research could be done in the decents, and is being done in the decents. So um, tomorrow, when I talk about my DNA research, I'll talk to you about the different genetic groups of decents that have been discovered so far. And there will be more to come. Do we want to know it all? Do we want to know it all, That's a very pertinent question. And of course, the strong association with Kinmore Abbey. Kinmore, the ruins there, so there's uh, possibly, there's more cases buried in that graveyard probably than any other graveyard. Many, all we know is the ones in a pitstone, but I'm sure there's many, many buried there that are unmarked graves going back for generations. So again, there's a very strong concentration of reasons in that area. So, it's a... Anyone else would like to... How about that cheating down there? It looks like a man that... West Sunday. West Sunday. Yeah, Pat, what did you say, Sunday? No, we don't. We're looking forward to Pat. What did you say, Sunday? Thanks very much. And thank you for your, your work in, in preparing it. Um, Anyone else would like to, I know it's a long night from here. It's time for wine. At the wine, I'm told that cheese and wine has arrived. So, without further ado, thanks very much for your attention. And enjoy the rest of the night.